you'd like to go ahead, you be first. Uh, just, just before you begin, I would like to say that if a question is on a particular difficulty in a particular parish with all kinds of details, it may not be possible for me to give you an answer because I would not have understood the situation enough. From my replies, you will see that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Your Eminence. Can you hear me? Yes. With regard to the mentally disabled people, who decides if and when they should receive their first Holy Communion, and how does one come to this decision? And then I have a second part. What if one is already a communicating Catholic but becomes mentally disabled through accident or illness? Could their disability be a cause to discontinue giving them Holy Communion? Thank you. In practice, the, the parish priest, the pastor, and his assistants, if it is a child in question, the parents also, they will put counsel, they will think together. Finally, the parish priest, the pastor, would be the one to decide. If his decision is finally not acceptable to the parents, they should seek dialogue with him. They remain free to appeal to the diocesan office. But of course, if they can get it settled in the parish, it's better. <clears throat> I would almost say the same for a person already communicating. Although there should be a presumption that the person knows enough about the body and blood of Christ to receive Holy Communion, a person who has been receiving. But sometimes there can be disagreement between two good people about whether it is wise to give Holy Communion to that person or not. Sometimes a doctor has to be consulted. <clears throat> but it is not a question cut and dry, very simple to solve. It is not very simple. Therefore, two good people can disagree on what to do. Good evening, Your Eminence. Um, my name is Tony Simo. I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, the question I have for you tonight, sir, uh, is regarding spiritual warfare, particularly uh, personal and local infestations. Uh, at a recent co youth conference in Virginia Beach, uh, a Catholic priest whom you may know informed the youth that Satan often uses black animals as agents of evil to spread infestation and, that, and suggested that if they have any black dogs and cats to get rid of them. He also said that anyone who eats Chinese food needs to make sure they bless it because whoever cooks it may worship Buddha and may uh, be at risk to be in fact infested. Do these teachings conflict or conform with the teachings of the Catholic Church? They Thank conflict. You. They do not conform with Catholic faith. They are full of superstition. So it's not a good directive to follow, whether to get rid of black animals. Superstition, pure and simple not to eat food cooked by Buddhists or Hindus. You are not serious. <laughs> you are not. I don't, when I say you, I don't mean the, the person who put the question, but, but the one who made the suggestion. Are you saying that we will only eat food if it is cooked by a daily communicant. Otherwise, we have to sprinkle holy water on it and, spr and sprinkle the water from Lourdes and say two rosaries and then two, two masses before we eat. That's exaggerated. <clears throat> I would almost accuse the person saying it of being the one 
from whom I will not accept food because he's full of <laughs> superstition. <laughs> <laughs> Your Eminence, the Our Father during Mass, um, holding hands or not holding hands, or does it matter? It is, it is not prescribed in the book for Mass that the people will hold hands, or even that the priest will hold hands. But it is prescribed that the celebrating priest at Mass during the Our Father will hold his hands that way, yes. It is not prescribed how the people are to hold their hands. If they want to hold that way, it's all right. If they want to hold that way, it's all right. But it is not prescribed. But when a person goes, then prescribing is too much. Got it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Your Eminence, I have three questions. Um, the first one is um, on the rules of exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. For instance, if it's 24 hour and for some reason one hour can't be covered, do you have to repose the Blessed Sacrament? And if you do, how many times would that be allowed? And also, is it allowed to expose the Blessed Sacrament like during a retreat when someone is speaking, giving a talk? Oh, you said three questions. Well, that's, sorry. That's already three. <laughs> or is this one? That's one with several parts. Oh, I see. <laughs> I may have to understand well. You mean there is blessed sacrament exposed in the monstrance? Yes. And the people are adoring, but there is one hour when there is nobody to adore. Uh -huh. And you are asking, is it then obligatory to put the blessed sacrament back into the tabernacle? I am not sure whether there, whether there is any rigid law laid down for that. But the idea would be that if there are not people adoring, the Blessed Sacrament is put back. But when it is a few minutes, it looks meticulous to insist there. What is more important is security. That the Blessed Sacrament be not exposed and there's nobody there in case there is somebody of bad will who comes there to take away the Blessed Sacrament. That is more urgent, uh, the security part of it. If that is secure, in many places they have iron grating so that even if a person wished, he could not get at the monstrance. That's more urgent. During retreat, it is when the Blessed Sacrament is exposed, we are expected to be in prayer and adoration. Yes. During a one-hour adoration, the priest can give a brief reflection or there can be reading of scripture. It should not be, but if it is a whole retreat with a long retreat conference, then it is better that the Blessed Sacrament be not exposed. If it is a short reflection, it's all right. But it is not something rigidly laid down in the books. It is not. Okay. Um, is there a time when dance is allowed during the Mass? And also, how about secular music? Ah, you said three questions. So <laughs> I, can first... I can sit down any time. I just thought I got to No, no. <laughs> dance is not known in the Latin rite of the Mass. Our congregation has considered it for years. There is no major document of the church on that. But the directive we give from our congregation is this. In the strict liturgy, that means the Mass, the sacraments, Europe and America 
should not talk of liturgical dance at all. Because dance, as known in Europe and North America, does not, is not part of worship. So they should forget it and not talk about it at all. But it is different in Africa and Asia. Not a concession to them, but because their culture is different. If you give a typical African the gift to bring at offertory, and you give a typical European the same gift to bring, if they don't see one another, the European will be rather stiff in walking to the altar. The African is likely to have movement right, left. It is not a dance. It is a graceful movement to show joy and offering. Also, in Asia, they have refined movements showing respect, adoration, joy. In Africa, all the cultures are not the same. If you are in Ashanti in Ghana, they have some refined movements. The bishops of each country have to watch this, knowing that the aim, the reason for mass, the reasons are for adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and asking for what we need. If the movements help towards that, yes. If they do not, no. Now, if you say dance in Europe and in North America, people think of Saturday evening, ballroom dance, one man, one woman. And it is all right as recreation. But we do not come to Mass to enjoy. We don't come to Mass to admire people and clap for them and say, repeat, repeat, wonderful, excellent. That is all right for the auditorium, for the theater, even for the parish hall. Presuming that the dance is acceptable, from moral point of view, because there are some dances that are wrong everywhere. <laughs> Even in the parish hall and in the theater, they are wrong because they are provocative unnecessarily. So, and also in Africa and Asia, every dance is not acceptable. There are some dances that are totally not acceptable in any religious event. So it, it differs. But as for North America or Europe, we think that the dance should not enter the liturgy at all. And the people discussing liturgical dance should spend that time saying the rosary. <laughs> uh, or they should spend that time reading one of the documents of the Pope on the Holy Eucharist. We have already enough, we have already enough problems. Why banalize more? Why desacralize more? Haven't we already enough confusion? Yeah. Amen. If you want to admire a dance, you know where to go. But not mass. And then the, the not other you, of course. It's other people. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the secular music, you know, not... Ah, yes. Obviously, every music has its own setting. We come to Mass for, again, those four reasons I mentioned. Does that music mean adoration of God or praise of God or asking pardon for our sins and the reparation or begging God for what we need? Recreation is very different. Okay. The, you know, the maestro who gesticulates and makes funny movements, most of them unnecessary. And then he finishes, he makes a, bit, a deep bow, and there's a standing ovation. That's good for theater, but not for mass. <laughs> Young people's rock music, they enjoy, enjoy, is good for picnic, <laughs> but not for mass. Everything has its proper place. Therefore, the bishops of each area should get a good music commission okay. so that they have music book 
containing Catholic hymns so that only Catholic hymns are sung because what we sing should manifest what we believe and should nourish our faith and not just sing anything. It should be theologically deep, liturgically rooted, and musically acceptable. Unfortunately, many things sung in some Catholic churches should not figure at all inside the church. Okay, and last but not least, I'm gonna sit down. How do you respond to a, a priest who tells you uh, things are not any worse today in the time of, than they were in the time of St. Augustine or when the, the popes were corrupt? And it was just a, a response to a comment I had made about relativism and that I was worried about the damage it was doing to our teens today. I will ask him, Father, I want to know what you are saying. Are you listening? Or are you backing out? <laughs> I thought you were listening for the response. Um, I, I would say to the priest, are you saying that telling lies was bad at the time of St. Augustine? And you don't see why we shouldn't tell lies today. People stealing other people's husbands or wives was bad at the time of St. Augustine. So it is not any worse today. People not going to mass at that time was bad. And therefore, it shouldn't be any worse today. What is he talking about? So we should say to him, Jesus said, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So, the, the gospel preached without discount. We don't comfort ourselves to say, there were thieves before in the Middle Ages, so do not worry about thieves today. It's not a good argument. Good evening, Your Eminence. I have uh, one question in two parts. What is the Vatican's teaching on natural family planning? And what should a diocese or parish do to promulgate the teachings of natural family planning, since so few Catholics seem to know about it? All right. It isn't Vatican teaching. Vatican is that area in Rome, a small area where the Pope lives. And you can go around it in 45 minutes. <laughs> that is Vatican City. I am a citizen of Vatican City. But I think that what you meant is, what does the Catholic Church teach? Correct. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Catholic Church, which is in Rome, and also in Tokyo, and Caracas, and also in Steubenville, and in Washington, D.C., and in Lagos, and uh, in New Delhi. That's the one. What is <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so. The Catholic Church teaches that if husband and wife, with the advice of a good doctor, because science comes from God, if they consult a good doctor or even a nurse, or even Dr. Billings of Australia, who died recently, they can advise them about the times when the wife is not likely to have a baby so that if they have good reason for spacing the arrival of children, they take that into account in their relationships. That's the natural family planning. It respects God's ordering. It respects the dignity of man and woman. It also entails sacrifice, self-discipline. And that is what makes love and also joy and also respect for self and respect for your marriage partner. It also helps for stability of marriage. Selfishness never led to stability of marriage. What should parishes do? Parish or diocese should strive to make it easier for husband and wife to get the correct information. When I was archbishop in Nigeria, at the level of the diocese and also the bishops' conference of the whole country, we got knowledgeable doctors. And we got a sister doctor, religious, who was a medical doctor and put her full time, paid. So she went through dioceses, organizing units to advise 
husband and wife. It is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. It is better to advise husband and wife about natural family planning than simply to tell them that abortion is a mortal sin, and it is. That contraception is a mortal sin, and it is. But natural family planning is a positive response. Your Eminence, my question is about spiritual bouquets. Um, if a person desires to give, oh, their bishop or somebody uh, a spiritual bouquet of 365 rosaries, that would be a rosary every day a year, but then somebody, they, they want to give spiritual bouquets to somebody else too, and they, they'd like to give spiritual bouquet of rosaries maybe to somebody else and commit to that, then do they pray like two rosaries a day or can they add the other name on to the rosary that they're already praying for a spiritual bouquet for their bishop or some, the one that they first committed to? H how does that work? Well, if you promised me that you will say so many rosaries for me, then please say so many rosaries for me. <laughs> if after that you promise somebody else that you will say so many rosaries for that person, then please say so many rosaries for that person. It is like you promise me five dollars. Then, very good, give me the five dollars. If you promise him five dollars, it, they will not overlap with the other five. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> if a person is not, uh, people should be slow to promise what they are not able to do. So you promise what you can do. That's all. If you are not able to do it, do so many rosaries now, you do them later without worry. There, there should be no worry about it. But it isn't that when you promise many people rosaries, then you go and say one rosary, and say you bear all of them in mind. You, it's a type of um, little, you know, I nearly said the cheating, but I don't want to say that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so without any worry at all, promise people what you can do. And if you have not done it, do it when you are able, without worry. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Your Eminence. A public policy question with regards to frozen human embryos. There are tens of thousands of human embryos frozen across the United States that we know of, either as a result of in vitro fertilization or uh, experimentation uh, from the scientific community. What should legislators and other elected officials do to address uh, the frozen human embryos who are frozen and may be there in, uh, uh, for 10, 20, 30, 40 years to come? This is a more complicated and specific question, which a, a general practitioner like Cardinal Arinze may not be able to answer you immediately. <laughs> if you are very interested Please write out for that, because this is a question of legislators. And then I will give it to our expert, Bishop Zgretia in Rome. He is our expert on things touching life, and he can handle that. Uh -huh. You know there are many things that I do not know. I, I would be able to give a general answer, but I want that you get the very best and the most specific, so that they be not misled. And I'm in no way expert in that area. So if it continues to interest you, give it to me in writing with your address tomorrow. Latest after mass tomorrow. Your Eminence, thank you for your prophetic witness. Um, I am a father of three small children, and we go to daily mass seven days a week. And um, when we approach communion time, um, we all go to the altar together, and um, usually we go 
with our children in front of us. And recently, our local bishop has uh, made a directive that parents should um, keep their children from approaching for a blessing in single file in the communion line. And um, it just, it, it perplexed me a little bit, the directive, because it seemed to go against Jesus' directive of not to hinder the, the children to come to him. And um, also the priest's consecrated hands and his power to effect grace in a, in a blessing upon a child, uh, it seemed to contradict that as well. So I was just wondering what your opinion was on that directive. I know that there probably is no uh, liturgical directive against that. There is no liturgical directive against that and there is no liturgical directive in favor of that. None. Therefore, it is left to local practice. I would like you to know there are very few countries where that is done. United States is one, and perhaps Britain. Most countries in the world don't do it. In most parts of the world, when it is time for Holy Communion, only those who de facto are coming to receive communion come forward. Nevertheless, there are some parts where a Protestant, um, who knows he should not receive communion, comes and gets a blessing. Or even a Catholic, who knows he should not receive communion. We are not to ask him why. We are not God to judge the conscience comes and gets a blessing. So it is done in some countries. We examined it in Rome when we wrote the document on the Holy Eucharist, Redemptionis Sacramentum, three, four years ago, we decided to say nothing about it in order, in order to allow freedom to the diocese. Therefore, a bishop has the right to say, please don't do it this way or do it the other way. It is not a point worth fighting over. Therefore, follow the directive of the bishop on that point. Okay. That the children come to Christ to get his blessing, of course. The bishop would not have said, don't bring the child to the priest to bless at any time. Mm -hmm. I understand him as only saying, when it is time for Holy Communion, let it be only those who are coming to receive Holy Communion. Yes. And, and then just a practical follow-up to that. Are we to leave our children then in the pew or is, you know, even small children in the pew at time of communion or are we supposed to, because a lot of, you know, aisles in churches, there's, they're, they're not wide enough to carry them by your side. So practically it's even very um, complicated. A cardinal from the Vatican should not go legislating on a point like that. Okay. Okay. We, can, we must not speak from Rome on every detail, especially where it, there's no, we have to leave people to use their judgment on some things. They could be done this way or that way or that way. We leave people that freedom. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Yes. Good evening, Your Eminence. Good evening. I have a question on the catechism that usually comes up when talking to non-Catholics, and the statement being that salvate, or the sacraments are required for salvation. <coughs> and it seems like uh, Protestants or others always try to argue that point. If you had any insight to that statement. Huh. Yeah. Argue it in what sense? In that what sense the the, they, the, uh, the salvation being a gift from the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, how can the sacraments, how can the church say that the sacraments are required for that salvation, which is a gift? Is usually... Well, answer. I... Yeah, yeah go on. My, my answer to them is, is the sacraments, to me are showing my willingness to accept that gift. This person says he's a Protestant. This, this person? The person arguing. Yes, very much very so. Good. He's evangelical. I'll say, I'll say, very good, you are a Protestant and you read the scripture. 
Did you read where Christ said, unless a person be baptized of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven? He has read that. Baptism. Baptism. Christ. Right. Holy Eucharist. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will live in me and I in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's Christ speaking, which means the Holy Eucharist is necessary. Then he sent his church and he said to the apostles, He who hears you, hears me. He who despises you, despises me. That is Christ speaking to St. Peter and the 12 apostles. And through them, through the bishops of the whole church. Therefore, that church directs us. So tell him that he can have his opinion. But our faith is not a question of I think. No, no. It's a question of Jesus Christ has taught us through the church. That's our faith. That's why when we come for baptism, the first question is, what do you ask of the Lord? Baptism. What do you ask of the church of God? Baptism. What will faith, what will baptism profit you? Life everlasting. So we get, we, by faith and baptism, we enter the church. Through the church, we get faith in Christ. And that church then teaches us what to believe or not to believe. And that church teaches us the seven sacraments and how necessary are they for salvation, not equally. Baptism is vital. But even the ch same church teaches us what of those who could not receive baptism. Ah, you have to read then Lumen Gentium, paragraph 13, 14, 15, 16 to 17, the Vatican II on the church. Those who, through no fault of their own, you just imagine millions of people who never got any missionary to preach to them, never got anybody to baptize them. Are they, none of them going to heaven? So the question becomes, the salvation of those who, through no fault of their own, have not become de facto members of the church. All these are big theological questions. And this fellow is going in where angels are afraid to go in. <laughs> Thank you, Yevans. So he is giving opinion on big theological questions, things that are beyond him. Good evening, Your Eminence. Um, my question follows what you were just talking about. And what do you do with a child who is um, disabled um, and non-communicative, um, doesn't have the ability to communicate with you, but you know that they are, can interact with their surroundings? Not because they're um, deaf or can't talk, but such as a child who might be autistic or something like that. Um, what do you do about First Communion and um, the sacraments for a child like that? The situation has to be approached with great love and sympathy <laughs> and openness to all those who can help, beginning with the mother, who understands the child better than anybody else, then the father, then who, perhaps a doctor, perhaps a nurse, Perhaps special social workers, perhaps those who know sign language, all those people will contribute. The priest does not have the answer all in his, in his pocket, ready-made. He will hear all these people, and that will be the road to knowing what to do. But it would be good if they give priority to what the mother thinks. Because the mother has a way of understanding the child, which many others don't have. Well, um, I'm asking for a friend of mine, and she is very deeply pained that um, her child has not, you know, he's 10 and has not made his first communion. And, um, it isn't a matter of somebody learning his language. 
because he doesn't have any language, but she doesn't want him to not have the sacraments of the church. The theologians say that to receive Holy Communion, it would be, it would help the person knows what the person is receiving. Nevertheless, we take note that the Oriental churches give Holy Communion to babies as different from the Latin church. So we must make room for God's grace. And perhaps some of such people can be compared to babies. <coughs> I come back to my original answer. Mm -hmm. The mother becomes a key witness. Mm -hmm. And also anybody else who has a special gift in understanding that person. Mm -hmm. The priest should be sympathetic. And if there is any mistake, let it be on the side of mercy. Thank you. Your Eminence, um, I'm asking a question for my 16-year-old daughter, who is um, a liturgical musician. She plays for masses, piano and organ. And um, she, her organ teacher is a um, music minister at a Protestant church and has asked her if she would play sometime for their, one of their services, and she wants to know if that's permissible or not. I mean, assuming, of course, she's gone to her mass. She wants to know if that's permissible. She hasn't given Pre her an answer. Yeah, preferable if she does not. If there's an extraordinary occasion and she plays for them, she should not be condemned. But if they want her to do it on a regular basis, please no. Because it would look like she's saying that one way of worship is the same as the other. No, it wasn't if a regular basis, but she said, would you play occasionally? I don't, that, that's all we've, we I haven't have, answered yet. I have given about as much answer as I can give. Yeah. If it is regarded as exceptional. Uh, okay. but not uh, something regularly done every few months. Okay. Otherwise, they stampede her into uh, active participation in a worship that is not Catholic. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Your Eminence. Uh, on July 7th, the Holy Father came out with the documents on the uh, 1962 Missal and the uh, Old Latin Mass. Could you summarize what you think are the main points of that document and also the letter to the bishops that he sent on the same day and what you think uh, the impact on the church could be uh, from, from this document? On July 7th this year, Pope Benedict issued a document to say in brief that those who want mass celebrated according as it was done before the Second Vatican Council, that they can have it. There are details, conditions. We cannot go into all of them now. For example, it has to be in Latin. They will have to find a priest who knows good Latin and how to celebrate according to those books provided that the people do not challenge the Second Vatican Council and do not attack or challenge the way we say Mass today, then the Holy Father. But the only request to be allowed to have Mass as it was done before the Council because it suits their spirituality more. It helps them better to pray. The Holy Father does not want to say no to such people. Pope John Paul II practically said the same, except that Pope Benedict has widened the possible use of that older missile. That's, and the letter to bishops is essentially that. It is not, you ask me what will the impact be? I do not want to play the prophet. So, I, in some countries, there is no, no contestation at all. 
and therefore not much will change. In some countries, there has been some contestation that made people keep on requesting that mass. Unfortunately, one of the reasons why people request that mass is that some priests have not been following the church books faithfully <coughs> these 40 years. They go to the altar and they do something which they think, but not what Holy Mother Church wrote down. They think they are creative, they think they are spontaneous, they think to make the mass more interesting, but they are banalizing, they are desacralizing, and that's where some of the people then get sick and tired of that. And they say, enough. Let's go back to how the mass was 60 years ago. Unfortunately, some of the people who said that don't realize that even 60 years ago, there were some priests also who introduced abuses. But as the people didn't know Latin, they didn't know what the, the priests were talking about. So the, our prayer and hope is that priests especially be much more serious, <coughs> devout, and obedient in celebrating Mass. That the Mass is the Mass of the whole church, not the Mass of this priest or that priest or that priest. If all priests celebrated Mass in that beautiful way, those requesting that older form would be less. If all priests sang the Mass in Latin once a month or so, those talking of Latin Mass would be less. Because when some say Latin Mass, they mean the Mass as it was before, 60 years ago. Whereas the Mass as it is today can be sung in Latin, the whole thing. The whole thing can be in Latin. Even if you want the homily in Latin, it can be done. <laughs> if the priest will consent. <laughs> so what I am coming to is this. If only priests we are careful to follow the approved books. There would be less confusion in the liturgy. The people of God would be better nourished and there would be less tension. We have time for two more questions. Good evening, Your Eminence. I had two questions, but um, the first one is about, <laughs> is about vaccinations. I have um, a family of eight children, and my oldest one is an adult now, and it's been brought to my attention recently that there are a number of vaccinations that are given to children that are from aborted fetuses in that fetal cell line, and that they were begun that way, but they're not mass marketed necessarily that way using fetal cells anymore to produce them. Then there's other vaccinations. Some of those vaccinations can be duplicated, not using aborted fetal cells, uh, but there are some vaccinations that they have no alternative for. As parents, what is our obligation regarding the acceptance or use of vaccinations that were originated with aborted fetuses? It must be difficult for parents when a vaccination is to be given to their child to do their research to know the origin of the vaccine. It must be difficult. I would not think that parents would be bound to do all that. But once we have the knowledge, I guess the question is, because they're still producing vaccinations and they're still using aborted fetal cells to do that. So are we you know, bound to use alternative or refuse those vaccinations so that they will try to stop that process from continuing? I suggest you bring that question up in your diocese because it isn't just one parent or two. Okay. So that there'll be action by the church the, in, the, in the area. Okay. That will be more dynamic. Okay. Uh -huh. And my second question was just about um, the general state of things now with um, the way people are living, the younger generation as well, living together before marriage um, and situations like that. I have. 30-some nieces and nephews and various marriages are coming up and they're asking us to come and participate, getting married in a Catholic church by a Catholic priest, but we know they've been living together for months. And yet, you know, the discussion of being charitable and attending or, you know, standing on the ground of what the church teaches and not attending, what are we 
as you know, practicing Catholics to do to witness to our faith and the truth. Let's get the elements clear. You say one man and one woman are co living together as if they were husband and wife, but yes. they are not husband and wife yet. No, but they're engaged. Then, engaged what? to be married. That's the situation. Yeah, what you have said is unnecessary. I, that's okay. what I said. And then one fine day, they decide to marry in the church. Right. And your question is whether that day they decided on the wedding, you should attend that wedding or not. Correct. So you are suggesting that you prefer not to attend it in order to show that you don't approve that they lived together before. That they're actually living, yes, because if I speak to them about it and they choose not to end that situation before their marriage because I've witnessed We to take it. the elements separately. Okay. That they lived together before marriage mm -hmm. is a mortal sin. Correct. It is not right. There's no way it can be right. Mm -hmm. And they are not fit for sacraments. And even if they receive the sacraments, they get no grace at all. Correct. But they get one mortal sin on top of what they had before. That's cohabitation. But if they decide to marry in church now, and they go to confession, and they marry in church now, we cannot condemn that. We approve it, because at least they have now repented. No, my question is if they go to the marriage unrepentant, still living together, wanting to be married, and a priest is willing to marry them. And I've been told that, of course, the marriage will exist after that moment, and then their marriage needs to be accepted, even though they had lived My together answer before. is simple. After that, I will say no more. If they repent okay. for living together as husband and wife, whereas they are not husband and wife, and if they go to confession, and now they marry in church, then we have to thank God that they now marry in church and that they have now gone to confession. Okay. We have to thank God for that. And therefore, if you attend it, you do a good act. But if you say, I will not attend it because they lived in sin before, you are slightly tough. No, what I'm saying, Father, is they're Look, not... Look, enough is enough. Huh? No, but I don't think you understood. I was saying they did not confess it. They are not sorry about it. They're going into the situation already living together still. That's what I was saying, not that they would confess I answered it. you already. Okay. I said... If you are only, I don't think you heard all I said. I didn't I understand. Said, I didn't it, understand you completely. Uh -huh. I said, if they go to confession. Right, right. And I said, so they didn't. Thank you. You see, you, <laughs> if you listened more than you spoke, you might have got more. I said, if they go to confession, which means they regret, which means they repent. Uh-huh. If they do not repent, what do you want me to say? So allow the two who are standing there. To okay. Two more questions. Good evening. Um, one of my questions is um, concerning your thoughts on uh, Harry Potter and if it's appropriate for young people. There seems to be some, a uh, lot of views on that. And um, also, if there's any of, uh, official church teaching on acupuncture. On Harry Potter, I don't know enough. But I have heard those, some bishops who know about it, who are not happy, who do not approve, and who think there is subtle damage to children. But I don't know enough to pass any judgment at all about it. Acupuncture, I'm not aware of any church statement. If it is the way of many, some in Asia, who by pin, pin, they get the point of pain, and in that way they cure a disease, would there be any need for the church to say anything? It becomes just a means of cure. There is no church statement on it. So if they can cure a disease that way, very good. Okay, one, one final uh, question is um, uh, for churches that um, we've attended some churches in which the congregation stands during the consecration, 
um, and one church in which there were not even kneelers in the church. Is there a thought on that? Yes. The general instruction on the Roman Missal prefers that people will kneel down during consecration. There can be reason to excuse that. If it is open air and it rained, the ground is muddy. If a person has arthritis, if a person is too old, or you are holding a baby, it's too difficult. Those would be good reasons. But the normal posture would be to kneel down at consecration time. In some churches, the, some people have removed the kneelers. So there is only the place to sit. And if you are to kneel at all, you kneel on the bare floor. Those who removed the kneelers have done damage to the Catholic community. The church, the church never said that. Rome never said that. It is like some churches where they have removed the altar rails. The church from Rome never said to remove the altar rails. But if you can find any document from Rome saying, remove the altar rails, I will give you a turkey. <laughs> Thank you. For Unfortunately, after Second Vatican Council, some liturgy experts began to spread this idea. And we have reached a stage where some now are against kneeling. If you kneel, they are harsh on you. They treat you as if you did something wrong. What is wrong with that? If you believe that Christ is our God and he is present, why don't you kneel? Why don't you crawl? Why not show? Show respect. I grant that a diocese has the right to give instruction so that the congregation moves in the same way. When to stand or sit or kneel, the documents from Rome do not go to too much detail, allowing dioceses some freedom. When the diocese regiments too much, it becomes material for us to talk with the bishop privately. And our language would be, why do you regiment the people of God? Are the soldiers? Allow them some freedom. For example, when people have received Holy Communion, they return to their seats. There is no, reg no law from Rome whether they should kneel down or sit down or stand up. But in some dioceses, they are rigid. They say, if you receive communion, you come back to your seat, you must stand. And when the last person has received, everybody must sit. Are they soldiers? Where is freedom? Why not let the people of God who have received Jesus, somebody likes to kneel, another person wants to keep standing, another one wants to sit. It's all right. But don't fight now. Don't go home and say, now, Cardinal Arinza has told us to fight you people. That's not good. The Holy Eucharist is not the area for fight. But uh, you would like to know that even though receiving Holy Communion, the bishops conferences of each country are given the right to decide whether they will receive standing or kneeling or whether they will receive in the hand or on the tongue. But even if the bishops decide that the people will receive in the hand standing, as in the United States, our congregation in Rome has said, yes, provided that those who want to receive kneeling, you leave them full freedom. And those, those who want to receive on the tongue, you leave them in peace and not in pieces. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Your Eminence. Good evening. Final question. Thank you very much. Um, as you probably know, in American politics, there are many um, prominent American Catholic politicians uh, on the abortion issue who say 
uh, to appease the voters, they say, well, personally, I'm against abortion, uh, but who am I to say that's a personal decision for that other person, and they vote uh, for that right for that person to choose. Yeah. Um, it is my understanding that when you um, publicly profess uh, something that is contrary to the church's teaching and belief, that's heresy, and, and that the remedy for heresy is, is if they continue in that heresy and continue to profess something contrary to the church's teaching, the remedy is, one of the remedies is excommunication. My question is, what can the Holy See uh, do? Uh, what type of power uh, or pressure can they exert, the, the Holy See that is, upon the American bishops to remedy this situation in their own particular diocese that applies to certain bishops in America? Well, you have used some words from canon law and theology, which um, if a person wants to be precise, in, since you have used words like church teaching, heresy, ah, then I have, it is my duty to retouch it a bit. <laughs> the question of voting abortion is not Catholic law, but divine law. So those who kill unborn babies are breaking not the law of the church, but the law of God. Then it isn't just that they have gone against God, church teaching, but they have gone against divine law. Thou shalt not kill. To the person who says, personally, I am against abortion, but then uh, if people want to do it, I leave them free, you could say, you are a member of the Senate or the Congress. Personally, I am not in favor of shooting the whole lot of you. But, but if somebody else wants to shoot all of you in the Senate or all of you in Congress, it's just pro-choice for that person. <laughs> but personally, personally, I'm not in favor. That is what he is saying. He is saying that personally, he is not in favor of killing these millions of children in the womb. But if others want to do it, it's pro-choice. That's what he's saying. And then you ask me, what does the Holy See do? Why doesn't the Pope send 12 Swiss guards to arrest, <laughs> arrest them all? <laughs> you may have heard about a letter which the present Holy Father as prefect of the Congregation for Doctrine, sent to American bishops on that issue. So the matter is very clear. Once people ask me, if a person votes for abortion, can the person receive Holy Communion? My reply was, do you really need a cardinal from the Vatican to answer that? Get the children for First Communion and say to them, Somebody votes for the killing of unborn babies and says, I voted for that. I will vote for that every time. And these babies are killed, not one or two, but in millions. And that person says, I am a practicing Catholic. Should that person receive communion next Sunday? The children for first communion will answer you that at the drop of a hat. You don't need a cardinal to answer that. So, of course, you are not doubting. I'm not accusing you of doubting. You are only asking for action. I'm asking how, how can there be action, whether it's, the, it's divine law, as you say, which, is, which the church, of course, follows divine law, sure. thou shalt not kill. We have no and, choice. And, and, and if you have someone that's publicly professing that it's okay for someone else to do that, what type of pressure can be put on um, some bishops that allow 
that don't understand what that first communicant just understood. <laughs> what if 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 that fir, if that seven year old can understand it, and you have a seven year old bishop that doesn't understand it, yeah. what can be done either by the Holy Swiss, uh, the, the the Holy See, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Swiss, the Holy Swiss Guards? Or Cardinal Lorenzi. I can, I can see that you have very clear ideas. And, <laughs> and that you think that something should be done about it. Well, yeah, it's do, clear. You, do you have ideas? Yeah, you have, you, you have made a good point. Do you have any ideas? I do have some ideas. <laughs> I have. I have. But I think that for the purposes of our discussion today, it might be enough. Thank you. And I agree with you, eh? You, you, you made very good points. <laughs>